everyone uh, to this session. Uh, so we are here with Mary Pat Peterson. Uh, Mary, Peter Mary is a PhD student at the University of Hamburg and she's working on Spinoza and she will be sort of telling us about Spinoza today. Uh, she's previously studied in Edinburgh and the New Sc uh, School of New York City. And her talk uh, is titled Apricot Bonbon to a Free Man, Lee Spector and Spinoza. So thank you very much, Mary, and the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. And please do stop me if there's any issue transitioning with the slides, because I'm kind of working with a novel, so covering a lot of ground with plot and characters. Um, I am going to be talking about the theme of freedom in Spinoza's ethics and its uptake in Clarice Lispector's 1943 novel, Near to the Wild Heart. I became interested in this project as an undergraduate five years ago, um, when I first read Near to the Wild Heart, and I was moved by the book and I was also sort of astonished by how well I thought Joanna's character, the protagonist captured this ambiguity in um, Spinoza's philosophy that I think is a, a big problem for Spinoza. So this ambiguity is a kind of variation of an ambiguity found in Descartes' cogito. So whereas in the cogito, it's not fully clear if our thinking rests on God or on the self. In Spinoza, it's not fully clear if the intellectual love of God is an, a real encounter with God, a kind of a real union or just an encounter with the self, just kind of hitting up against our psychology. And the way Lispector writes Joanna's thinking and kind of the way she transitions from the first, the second and the third person narrative perspective captures this kind of um, confused description of thinking that I think happens in Spinoza but extremely well. But before I get to um, Spinoza and freedom, I'm going to give some background on Lispector, um, just specifically the year 1942 when she was writing Near to the Wild Heart, what was going on in her own life then and what was going on in um, Brazil more kind of broadly. As a prefatory remark, I'm not attributing a philosophical position to the specter. So I do not suppose that she makes arguments in her novels, but rather I suppose that her novels are philosophically significant. And I make an argument about Near to the Wild Heart. The novel is a work of art, it's a piece of literature. So by giving a quasi rationalistic reading, um, it will limit the book in certain ways. Um, I might also not say that Lispector is a philosopher if you take a philosopher to be someone who makes arguments. Um, I don't have a particular stake in, in whether or not she is a philosopher because she is so clearly and, and establishedly a novelist. But we can discuss that more in the Q&A if you'd like. So Rio in 1942, um, Clarice Lispector was 22 years old when she wrote this novel. So to be clear, she wrote the novel in 42, it was published in 43. She was a, a student studying law at the University of Brazil. She was born in Ukraine in 1920 and emigrated as an infant with her family um, to Northeastern Brazil and went to Hebrew school before winning really this very prestigious position at university. She lost both of her parents, her mother in 1930 and her father in 1940. So by the time she wrote this novel, um, she had lost both of her parents and um, had two sisters remaining alive. She was already a published journalist. She'd written a short story that was published in a magazine and she worked as an editor for a government press service. I include this and I think it's really important because even um, at an early age and before kind of 64, so before the military dictatorship in Brazil, there was already um, state repression and um, particularly a, a kind of close watch on, 
on what was published under Getulio Vargas's regime. So in 42, Lispector Spector would have been very aware of what was permissible and impermissible to uh, report and publish. And so when we read her novels, we should take that kind of awareness um, and keep it in mind, especially because her novels don't, until the hour of the star at the very end of her career, seem to engage too explicitly with political themes. So we, we should sort of read between the lines, um, I think throughout all of her work. 42 is a time of personal transition from a, a poor immigrant upbringing to becoming sort of one of the educated elite. Um, soon after finishing the novel, she would marry a fellow law student um, turned diplomat and leave Brazil to live in Italy, Switzerland, England, and the US. Um, so she left Brazil um, from 44 to 59. But before that, she was granted citizenship in January of 43. In Brazil more sort of broadly, 42 was the year the country entered World War II, fighting on the side of the allies. Um, the country was modernizing and um, growing industry and um, growing the economy. Vargas was um, interested in, in foreign trade and in um, establishing connections with um, powers in, in Europe and in North America. The, um, he was also interested in growing cities and establishing a closer relationship between individual states and the federal government. The religious context um, of the novel, and this is really important, is um, a Roman Catholic nation, but Roman Catholicism was often practiced by lay people with a blend of other traditions, such as spiritism. And in Near to the Wild Heart, um, Joanna, for instance, um, meditates on Psalm 130, um, out of the depths I cry to thee, O Lord, but she, she takes the first phrase of the Psalm in Latin, interestingly enough. Um, her character is also um, named after Joan of Arc, and one of the other characters in the story sort of sees her as a saint, as a saintly figure. Um, and Joan of Arc was canonized in 1920, the year the Spectre was born. So I, I want to kind of keep this idea of a blend of religions um, in mind as we sort of move through Joanna's sort of mystical encounters um, and her sort of prayers. Now, before I move to my central claim, I'm going to give just a brief overview of the plot. So just a brief synopsis. Um, the story itself is, well, the novel is not exclusively plot driven. It takes place mostly in Joanna's head and her thoughts um, and in her memories. So she is a, a young woman who's been, who's recently married, Ottavio, her husband. She spends much of her time inside of her home, remembering her childhood, kind of piecing through what has happened up to this point in her life. Um, but a few things kind of occur in the present that are really important. So one, Ottavio uh, cheats on Joanna with his childhood sweetheart, Lydia, and impregnates Lydia. Um, Joanna learns about the pregnancy from Lydia and, and has an affair herself. Um, that relationship falls apart and um, Ottavio and Joanna's marriage dissolves. Um, at the end of the novel, Ottavio has left Joanna um, in anticipation that she will leave him first. And Joanna is sort of um, finally reckoning somehow with her childhood and sort of with all these memories that she's had and is ready to sort of look to the future in some way. So my central claim is that in Near to the Wild Heart, these two main characters both strive to be free in Spinoza's terms. So Tavio strives to embody the model of the free man, Joanna to achieve freedom by her intellectual power. And I should be clear, um, Spinoza is quoted at length in this novel. So Lispector was reading Spinoza's ethics um, likely in French. And 
Otavio is is working on a piece about Spinoza. Um, so the, the connection's already sort of explicit in the novel. Um, and he's really um, very consciously striving to embody this model to the very letter. And he's painted as being kind of pathetic for um, hanging on Spinoza's words so closely and trying to sort of follow every step. Um, Joanna, on the other hand, is, is sort of more intuitive. So she has a more intuitive relationship to um, Spinoza's ideas. Um, at one point, she tucks a note into her husband's notes about Spinoza. And she says, essentially, you know, you need to stop worrying so much and just sort of hear the music. And the note it includes something about Bach. And um, Joanne is, is pictured as being sort of closer to Spinoza's ideas by hanging on them less tightly. She's also more powerful intellectually than her husband. So she's smarter than he is, essentially. Nevertheless, both characters, I think, fail to achieve freedom, not because they're in bondage to their affects, but rather because circumstances thwart their striving. And by circumstances, I mean, well, this could mean social structures, sort of larger historical events. But I think here, crucially, they mean a circumstance is, is the relationship between Otavio and Joanna and the internal dynamics of that relationship not merely their own thoughts and feelings about the relationship, but a relationship as something that's happening to them. I think they're not free in part because of the way they're treating one another. So what does Spinoza say about the free man? And the rest of the talk will be essentially um, textual support for this claim, both from Spinoza's ethics and also from the novel. Quote, we shall easily see what the difference is between a man who is led only by an affect or by opinion and one who is led by reason. For the former, whether he will or no, does those things he is most ignorant of, whereas the latter complies with no one's wishes but his own and does only those things he knows to be the most important in life and therefore desires very greatly. Hence, I call the former a slave, but the latter a free man. So the free man has um, ordered his priorities correctly and desired um, accordingly. The, the slave, the sort of unfree person is um, thrown sort of in every direction by his affects and is led by opinion. Now this is an example of Otavio's kind of musings on Spinoza. So this is how he's reading Spinoza. Quote, don't forget, the intellectual love of God, and he has translated this himself from Latin, is the true knowledge and precludes any mysticism or adoration. Many answers are to be found in Spinoza's statements. For example, in the idea that there cannot be thought without extension, a mode of God, and vice versa, isn't the mortality of the soul affirmed? Of course, mortality as a distinct reasoning soul, the clear impossibility of the pure form of St. Thomas's angels. So he's comparing Spinoza and Aquinas here. Um, his reading of, of Spinoza is more kind of rationalistic than Joanna's in the sense that Joanna is, um, is sort of having mystical experiences and is also worshipful. So she worships God in the novel. Um, and he sees true knowledge as, as not in kind of incorporating um, a worshipful stance. Um, he's also sort of mining Spinoza's words for answers. A bit more on his character. He sees the um, Spinoza's free man as a hero. Um, so he sees freedom as tied to personal narrative and courageous acts. And freedom is greatness, meaning greatness, uh, yeah, greatness meaning being recognized in a certain kind of way for, um, for one's heroism. Otavio is, is cruel, he is an unkind character, and he mistreats um, both of the women with whom he's engaged um, sort of intimately. He acts from hate, anger, envy, indignant scorn and pride, which is of course precisely what Spinoza says the free man does not do. Um, however, he thinks that Spinoza's words act on him um, with the desired effect. 
quote, neither understanding or volition are part of God's nature, says Spinoza. This makes me happier and freer because the idea of the existence of a conscious God is horribly dissatisfying. Um, so it's it's kind of clear through the way the character is sketched and the sort of actions that you know we we see him kind of commit that um, he thinks he's free but he's not. And here is a, a kind of example. So he's sat down for the day to work on this piece he's writing about Spinoza, but he started to have intrusive thoughts about about Joanna and um, how much she kind of scorns him and. Um, he thinks that perhaps she she thinks that he is stupid and he's right. She does think that. Um, so he he's sort of tormented and finally he puts down his work and he decides to go to go see Lydia. And he thinks to himself, he was free because he'd put aside he'd put aside this sort of stress and how simple everything became sometimes. So then he walks out, he went out, took his time choosing a bag of bonbons. He ended up with a fairly large bag of apricot ones. When he turned the corner, he'd suck on a, the, his first bonbon hands in pockets, his eyes filled with tenderness thinking about it. Why not, he asked himself, suddenly irritated. Who said great men don't eat bonbons, except that in biographies, no one remembers to mention it. What if Joanna knew about this thought of his? So he's, he's kind of plagued by an insecurity that he's not... Um, He's not acting in a way that's sort of great enough or grandiose enough to be heroic. Um, and so though he, he feels free at one moment, he's sort of plagued at the next with insecurity and self-doubt. But I want to argue this is not simply because he's in bondage to his affects. I mean, he's having sort of small thoughts, but it's in fact because he's mistreating the people around him and then feeling a sense of sort of shame. Um, so I'm moving now, we have this kind of one character who's who's stuck in book four of the ethics and understands some, some pieces of Spinoza's thinking but is missing the, the bigger picture um, and is very much not free. So I'm moving now to Joanna, who's, whose character gets it, a, gets it better than Otavio's does. Um, and we kind of move into the ethics book five. And so I'll discuss sort of her, her inner thought life now. So what does Spinoza say about freedom in book five? Quote, insofar as God loves himself, he loves men and consequently his love of men and the mind's intellectual love of God are one and the same. From this, we clearly understand wherein our salvation or blessedness or freedom consists that is in a constant and eternal love of God or in God's love for men. So there's a kind of reciprocity between the mind's love of God and God's love of people, God's love of humans. Um, it's something of a loop. And I think Joanna understands this well here. Now this is at the end, really very near to the end of the novel. Oh, how she harmonized with what she thought and how what she thought was grandiosely, overwhelmingly fatal. I just want you gods so that you, and you can see the shift, the narrative shifts here in perspective. I just want you gods so that you may take me in like a dog when everything is merely solid and complete again. When the movement of emerging my head from the waters is just a memory. And when inside me, there is only knowledge which has been used and is used and through it, things are received and given again, oh God. What was rising in her was not courage, she was substance alone, less than human. How could she be a hero and want to defeat things? So first of all, she's, she's moved past sort of what her husband thinks about freedom in the sense that she doesn't need to be a hero. Um, she understands a kind of unity, unity with substance um, and doesn't need to be courageous, doesn't need to sort of act with any kind of grandiosity. Um, and I think this bit about being only knowledge, which has been used and is used and through it things are received and given again is the kind of reciprocity that Spinoza mentions. Um, so I think she has her finger on the pulse of something that's quite true to Spinoza's thinking. 
However, um, there's a lot going on in her in her character kind of behind um, behind these thoughts and behind these words. So for one, she's at a, a critical distance from all of the other characters, but especially her husband. I mean, she spends the most time with him and she pities him, which Spinoza sees mostly as a sad affect. But I think she does both of these things. So she kind of distances herself intellectually, using her intellect from him and pities him out of a desire to protect herself and preserve herself. And she's rational for doing that. Um, but she's ultimately a passive character in the face of every everything that happens. Um, and this is really painful to witness. It, it seems on the one hand that she has thoughts that are very deep, but she takes flight to them in a way that becomes a kind of abuse of her own intellect. Um, so for instance, in one scene, um, she meets a woman um, and envies the woman because she has a, she's, she feels that this woman has a very kind of strong erotic life force and just very powerful. So Joanna decides to describe the woman in a way that does some violence to her person, um, that she's, she's sort of, not smart enough so that to to be anything more than just a, a sort of powerful life force. And then Joanna recognizes after she's done this that she she just wanted to remove her own sort of sad affect and did so by a cruel description of this other person. Um, so there's a sense in which though Joanna is very powerful herself and very intellectual that she's using her intellect in a way that's more constraining than freeing. Um, and just as a kind of um, character point, um, she meditates on a number of philosophical themes, um, such as God, animality, the relationship between the animal and the human. Um, the animal uh, horses, for instance, come up time and again. Um, she also she also kind of meditates on the concept of memory and also freedom. As I've said, she follows kind of the spirit, but not the letter of Spinozism. So to wrap up, I think both of these characters have a number of different ideas about freedom as they do a number of different ideas about all sort of um, a lot of different philosophical topics, but they both sort of think the other is um, either more free than they are or constraining their freedom or in some way a, a blockage to them. And I think this becomes um, a kind of litmus test for the health of their relationship. So for instance, Joanna feels that Otavio's presence and even the knowledge that he exists takes away her freedom. And we know that this can't work, that this won't, <laughs> this won't stand, that their relationship sort of has to fall apart if this is how she feels. And then on the other hand, Otavio projects freedom onto Joanna and envies and resents her um, while he feels that he's kind of constrained by all of these small and sad thoughts. She, on the other hand, is completely unconstrained. Um, so the way in which they kind of project onto one another um, not only shows that they're not free, but actually um, keeps them from achieving the freedom they want. And those are my sources. Thank you.